All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Drawing 102 session. I'm glad we were able to actually have it today. I was having some technical issues towards the end of the day today. It was making me nervous. Um, but we were able to meet, and we're able to go ahead and get into um, our session for today. So what we're going to be talking about is going to be perspective drawings uh, with one-point and two-point perspective. So as a reminder, um, you know, I definitely would like to see you guys with uh, your uh, hand projects. Um, I believe we were talking about the negative space and how to draw your hand. Um, obviously, try your best with that. Um, it, it, again, it, it'll take you a while to understand how to exactly draw the hand, but hopefully you guys learned something last time and was able to create a really nice drawing. Um, just make sure that you guys do upload it into Art Sonia. Um, and then we're just going to kind of dive right in to a little bit of art history first to kind of explain perspective, specifically linear perspective. And we're going to start with uh, Brunelleschi's experiment. So Renaissance artists from the early 14th century, so 1300s, which are the early Renaissance artists, to the 16th century or 1500s. Um, so we're looking at like Michelangelo, Raphael, all of those normal um, Renaissance type style artists, ended up achieving a magnificent feat in art from perspective uh, to anatomical accuracy of the human anatomy. So they not only learned about the human body as well as how to draw it anatomically correct, but also about perspective within a drawing, within a painting, and so on. They were able to achieve um, through careful observation of nature, including studies of dissections of human uh, bodies, uh, was the means to recreate the three-dimensional physical reality of the human form on a two-dimensional surface. So basically, they, they took the human body, um, they did... Uh, various scientific studies such as dissections and other things. Um, for instance, I believe da Vinci is the most famous out of all of them that have done that. Um, and they were able to learn about the proportions, the sizes of the human hand, the arms, the body, the head, how tall a human can be. And this is where we get most of those under of, of that understanding today. Um, in fact, I believe da Vinci's uh, drawings and studies are still used in medical textbooks um, as of today because they're so accurate. Now, in 1420, Brunelleschi's um, experimentation of mathematical equations and perspective helped skyrocket all future artists in understanding on linear perspective. So all thanks to his experiment, we now understand linear perspective and how to apply it um, not only in drawings, but with drafting, interior design, architecture, and things like that. His biographer, whose name was Antonio Menetti, who was actually writing his biography 200 years after Brunelleschi, um, but his, his uh, biographer described the experiment based on careful mathematical calculation. Um, it seems reasonable to assume that Brunelleschi's devised uh, the method of perspective from architectural purposes. So what I wanted to show you from top to bottom in, this, in these photos is that the top part is the actual architectural uh, uh, space. This is the elevation of San, Santo Spirito in Florence, Italy. It is a church, I believe, um, and it is open for public tour as well as it has services there. And then on the bottom is the drawing of the place. So, and they're, they were both created by the same artist. So uh, Bruno Leschke's, uh was actually a uh, architect as well as a drawer. So what I want you guys to notice with these two photos here, um, or these two images, is how the linear perspective is, where the lines are, how the columns are lined up in a row, how everything kind of goes to the central piece, right? Wherever you're looking at, it all kind of draws a line directly to the center. So we would actually call this a one-point perspective, such as there is one point and everything goes to that point or comes from that point. 
Whereas with this drawing, it's slightly off center, but it's still the same thing, right? You still have all the lines. Everything is pretty much lines up exactly the way it should be, all going to one point. And this is what I'm talking about with linear perspective is that we actually see the angles and the perspective in architecture as well as in drawings. So with linear perspective, 10 years later, there was a painter made named um, Masaccio, I believe is how you would say it, um, who applied the new method of the mathematical perspective even more spectacular in his fresco, The Holy Trinity, which we see on the left. Um, this has a barrel vaulted ceiling, which is what this is called here. It's almost like a barrel. Um, we call it a barrel vault. Um, barrel vaulted ceiling is incredible in its complex mathematical use of perspective. Lines overlay um, Masaccio's, yeah, Masaccio's actual geometric framework to make clear the uh, structure of the perspective itself. So, for instance, the reason we say this is because there's a barrel vault, right, on the top. All of the corners go down to one central piece, and the center of this picture would be Jesus on the cross here. Um, and then you would see a triangle, right? Everyone's about the same height, at the same level, but nobody's taller than Jesus aside from God himself being behind him. Down below... This also gives you another different type of perspective. This gives you a straight face forward perspective. So we see the box here receding in the background with its own linear perspective. This is basically the burial tomb. Um, and the columns here would be straight on compared to, as you can see here, everything's angled, right? So this has a couple different things. And this is a fantastic masterpiece, really, um, about perspective. So the next thing that I wanted to show you, hopefully you guys can click the link, I think, from this page, but if not, there's the link here. Basically, if you open up this page, um, this will actually give you um, the website under Khan Academy, and this will allow you to play around with linear perspectives. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so you guys can see. Okay, let me see. Can you guys see? this page for Khan Academy. I don't know if I'm actually sharing my screen. Is this showing up? No. Oh, is this it? Yes. Perfect. You guys see this screen? And it's moving. You guys see that? You type in the chat and let me know. Okay, so I'm going to just assume that you guys can see the screen. So with this linear, linear perspective interactive, um, basically this allows you to take your vanishing point, which is the VP, that's what I was talking about with the architecture, everything coming to one point. And what you can do is you can move this around in whatever direction so you can see the different angles and how you would draw it. You can even make it taller, shorter, squatter. You can make it wider or smaller. It just kind of depends on what you guys would like to do with it.
So I want you guys to play around with this, especially when you're trying to figure out about your perspectives. Um, especially when it comes to drawing our next project. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to watch a video about the historical perspective, which goes into more detail. Then we're going to talk about the one-point perspective and the two-point perspective. Okay. This is a video about the elements of linear perspective with a little bit of history thrown in. I love linear perspective. It's hard not to love linear perspective. It's like this magic formula. Well, look what even Paolo Uccello was able to do just a few decades after linear perspective was first discovered. So linear perspective is a way of recreating the three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional surface, and it's really accurate. Well, look at this Paolo Uccello. Look at this study of a chalice. This wasn't done on a computer. This was done with pen and ink on paper. No Photoshop. No Photoshop. So let's give a little bit of historical background, and then we'll talk about how it's done. OK, so let's start first with what the problem was. OK, so here we have a painting from the early 1300s by an artist named Duccio, who's painting in Siena. And you can see that Duccio is interested in creating an earthly space for his figure of the angel Gabriel and Mary, but that the space doesn't really make sense. OK, so what you're saying is that we have a kind of a real room here. We can see the beams in the ceiling. We can see the architecture. We can see the doors. And so he's really interested in putting these figures in a real place. The problem is, and by the way, don't get me wrong, I love Duccio. But the problem is, is that Duccio is not constructing that architectural space in a way that looks logical to our eye. And I think, you know, it probably wasn't a problem for Duccio, but it was a problem for artists about 100 years later who had a different goal. And their goal was a kind of really accurate realism on that flat surface. Okay, but before we leave the Duccio, let's spend just a moment being kind of unfair and finding what's wrong. Okay. okay so for one thing, the beams of the ceiling right up here don't agree spatially with the seat that the Virgin Mary is on or with this little stand for the Bible that we see here, or for that matter, with the lines that are constructed by the top of the capitals of these pilasters. So none of this is really making sense. Right, it's not a rational space. And there's this increasing interest in the 1400s in rationalism. That's the period that we really call the Renaissance. Right, the early Renaissance. And so in Florence in 1420, Brunelleschi, and let's put up a picture of Brunelleschi. Okay, so he's right here, Filippo Brunelleschi. And he discovers, or some would say rediscovers, because some think that maybe the ancient Greeks and Romans had this before, but he discovers linear perspective. So he was a genius. He was a Renaissance man. He was an architect. He was an engineer. He was a sculptor. And according to tradition, he had gone down to Rome, and he was studying ancient Roman buildings, ruins, and he wanted to be able to sketch them accurately. And he developed this system, linear perspective, as a way of doing that. And in 1420, in Florence, he demonstrated this system. And 15 years later, another brilliant Renaissance man, Alberti, codified what Brunelleschi had discovered. He explained the system of linear perspective for artists. So he publishes a book called On Painting in 1435. And we have a later version of that book right here. And inside that book, he really gives the formula for linear perspective. And that's what we have here. So let's just spend a moment talking about how this system works. OK, so let's go down here and let's actually do a diagram of linear perspective. OK, now I cannot do Paolo Uccello's chalice, but I can draw a basic linear perspectival structure. OK, go for it. OK, so first of all, we need to understand that one point linear perspective, sometimes called scientific perspective, is made up of three basic elements. There's a vanishing point. There is a horizon line and there are orthogonals. So let's start off with just creating a simple interior. I'm going to draw just a rectangle here. 
So this is your painting. This is your flat surface. That's exactly right. And I'm going to decide that the vanishing point needs to be pretty much in the middle. Okay. So I'm putting the vanishing point right about here. Okay. Okay. Now, let's see. Why don't you label that VP so we remember it's vanishing point. Okay, so that's the vanishing point. Now, what I want to do is I want to create a series of rays that move down to the bottom line. And these one could think of as kind of floorboards in a room, right? And artists had been able to do this long before linear perspective. Artists had never had a problem with this. Right. Well, that's because they were constructing it intuitively. And intuitively, when you look around at the world, you see walls in a room that look as though if they continued, they would meet. Or the floorboards look as though they would meet. So it, it's kind of intuitive. So I'm actually going to add not only a floor to this room, but I'm going to put in a couple of windows. We'll just make it very simple here. So I'm going to put in a couple of more verticals right here. And then I'm simply going to have all of this meet in the middle at that vanishing point. Now I'm going to use an eraser here just to clean this up just a little bit to get rid of some of the extraneous lines just to make things a little more clear. And voila, you can sort of see a window. Okay, I've got a window. Beginning to form. But now here's the problem. The problem was if you didn't want to have floorboards and instead you wanted to have a tiled floor, you had a problem. Because you know intuitively the horizontal lines have to get closer together as they go back in space. The problem is it's hard to exactly figure out what those proportions are as they get denser and denser as they go back in space so that the floor doesn't look like it's popping up. Which happened often, actually, in paintings from the Trecento. So the idea is that the tiles get smaller and smaller because things generally get smaller and smaller as they move away from us in space. Or appear that way, at least. Right. So what Alberti wrote down and on painting was that you need to have a second point in space outside of the picture plane that was at the level of your eye. So I'm just going to put it here. It's at the same level as the vanishing point, right? And so we would call this, of course, what? This is H. This is the horizon line. And what I'm going to, and I missed it, but there it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then what I would do, and I would, of course, do this more accurately with a ruler, is I would draw another series of rays from that second point. From the exterior point. That's right. And have it connect to each of those floorboards, right? And so as you can see, what's happening is that that angle becomes more extreme as I move across, right? And yep. I'm doing it freehand, so it's a little bit hard to see, but you get the point. Now, something really interesting just happened, which is I can now create a horizontal line that is at that first intersection. Do you see that right there? Mm -hmm. Going straight across. I see it. Then I can draw a second one at that second intersection, right there, and so forth. And they get more and more compressed as I go back in space. And the illusion should be then a kind of compression in space. So I think this will become more clear if I just do a little bit of erasing now. Okay, while you're erasing, I want to talk about that word illusion. Okay. Because I think it's key to everything here. Absolutely. What artists are looking to do is to create an illusion of reality on this two-dimensional surface. Alberti said a painting should be like a window. So in a way, you don't see the two-dimensional surface. This two-dimensional surface becomes something you look through to a world that is a continuation of our own world. So the idea of the illusion being incredibly convincing was so important to the artists of the Renaissance, artists like Masaccio, or later Piero della Francesca, or Andrea Mantegna. And so now I'm just going to fill in a few of these tiles alternating so that you really can get a sense of that floor in space. Whoops. So is that working? So even in this rough way here on this tablet, this is working, basically. It actually couldn't be rougher, <laughs> could it? Um, but I think it still makes the point. If I were then finally to get rid of these lines and, in fact, get rid of the vanishing point entirely and instead now draw in a back wall, we have something that comes fairly close to looking like an interior space. Now, that, what about putting figures in? Ah, so 
now you're really asking for trouble. I'm sorry, here. can you do that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. So if I were to draw a figure, what I would like to do is make sure that the eye level of the figure is approximately at the horizon line. So I would put that figure in just about here. And what if you put a figure more in the foreground or more in the background? So if I put a figure that was more in the foreground, I would still want their eye level to be at that imaginary horizon line. But of course now they would be larger. Right, so I think this is the part that's counterintuitive. The heads are on the same level and it's the feet that are on different levels. That's exactly right. And Alberti also said that that eye level, that horizon line, would ideally also be the viewer's eye level so that the perspective would really work perfectly. Okay, so we have orthogonals, the diagonal lines that meet at the vanishing point. We know the vanishing point is a point on the horizon line. And we understand how these correspond to the viewer and to creating an illusion of space. Let's take a look at what somebody who can really draw does with this. Okay. Let's take a look so, at Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. Okay, so not you. Not me at all. Someone who can really draw. Okay, so here is Leonardo's Last Supper. Immediately, the interesting thing is that after Brunelleschi discovers linear perspective, artists like Masaccio begin to use it, but they realize that in addition to creating an illusion of space, it has a way of bringing the viewer's attention to the vanishing point. So artists begin to use it not just to create that illusion, but they begin to use it expressively. And that's what we really see here with Leonardo. So not only is Leonardo creating this beautiful perspectival space, but he's also focusing our attention on Jesus Christ at the center, who is the vanishing point. Right. It brings our eye, our attention to the divine. So here we see Leonardo's Last Supper, and we can certainly just intuitively make out the orthogonals and the vanishing point. But let's go down and really look at the diagram. Okay, here we are. So it's interesting, their eye level all across is basically at the horizon line, and of course we see the vanishing point, the point where all of the orthogonals intersect, which is right here. And so we have all of these lines that are moving across this, this, the surface of this wall, and they're all bringing our eye right to Jesus Christ in the center. And those lines are orthogonal lines. And there you have it. That's linear, how it works. Linear perspective. So that's sort of how linear perspective would be like um, if you were studying, you know, artists and, and um, renaissance and things like that. And you can really see now that it's been explained, when you look at other paintings, you can pretty much kind of tell at that point where the linear perspective would be. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to be talking about wanting to do an interior drawing. Um, in one point linear perspective. So I have two other videos that I want to show you guys about one point perspective. Um, so we're going to take a look at both of them and then we're going to practice. While these videos are playing, feel free to follow along with your materials. Um, what you will need is a pencil, an eraser, your sketchbook. Um, if you have a straight edge or a ruler, I would say go ahead and grab that. If you don't have a ruler on hand, but possibly a book or something, you can use that as a straight edge or a ruler. Um, and what I want you guys to do is I want you in your sketchbook to kind of follow along with the video if you can, um, or jot down some notes to kind of help you um, as you create your uh, drawings and understanding one point perspective. Before we start the video, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Again, this is the linear perspective um, website that basically goes over those um, the vanishing point, the um, you know outside vanishing point, and things like that. So if you ever want to experiment with it, feel free to uh, go ahead and click on this link now if you guys can, um, and then just you know save it or whichever. You should be able to access it even after the class is finished. 
Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at the next video, which is going to be one point perspective. Perspective will always begin with a horizon line. Your horizon line is always at your eye level. If you are standing above the object that you are drawing, then draw your horizon line above that object. If you are below the object, then your horizon line will be below the object. In this case, theoretically, I'm staring at a hallway and I'm sitting in a chair. So my horizon line cuts across that hallway a little bit lower than center. I'm also sitting closer to the right hand side of the wall. So my vanishing point will be a little bit closer to the right wall at the end of the hall. You can imagine that your vanishing point is a dot that's right between your eyes along the horizon line. The lines that represent where the wall meets the ceiling and where the wall meets the floor will be drawn as diagonal lines that all converge at the vanishing point. Consider that the top of any doorway is parallel to both the floor and to the ceiling. Therefore, it must also meet at the vanishing point. You can use the end of the hallway as a reference to transfer measurements from the right-hand side of the hall all the way to the left-hand side of the hall. One easy trick is to imagine that there are only three kinds of lines when drawing one-point perspective. Horizontal lines, vertical lines, and diagonal lines. And every diagonal line will radiate out of the vanishing point. Use these rules to build any space you want, whether it be imaginary or whether you are looking at the exterior or the interior of any actual building. Okay, and then for the last video, I actually did not, it did not upload on the jigsaw. So we're going to head, go ahead, um, I'm going to click on the link and then just share my screen. Um, feel free to click that link if you would like. Hi, Tom here and welcome to... And, um, you know, we can, we can watch it together or whichever. So give me a second, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you guys 
we'll be able to see this. Um, as as this video plays, let me, if if one of you can type in the chat and let me know if you can hear it. Hi, Tom here, and welcome to my new Circle Line Art School video: How to Draw a Room in One Point Perspective for Beginners. In one point perspective, two parallel lines which are going towards the vanishing point will look like if they continued they'd actually meet exactly at the vanishing point and the vanishing point is always on the horizon line. The first step is to draw a horizontal line slightly above the middle of your page. Next, draw a cross at the centre of this line. This cross is the vanishing point and the line is the horizon line. The vanishing point must be on this horizontal line and as the drawing is in one point perspective we need just the one vanishing point, which is our cross. Now we can draw a rectangle for the back wall of our room. Draw the rectangle in the centre of your page with the horizon line going through it and the vanishing point in its centre. Next, to draw the sides of the walls of our room, all we need to do is draw four lines from the vanishing point. Now, each line needs to go past one of the corners of our rectangle, which is the back wall of our room. You could use a ruler for these straight lines if you wish. So now, it's a bit like looking into a box. Next, we can draw a line from the vanishing point to the left, to the left side of the paper. This new line, going towards the left, will help us find the top of a door. Now we can draw two vertical lines from this new diagonal line. And now we have a door in one point perspective. Next, we can draw two more lines from the vanishing point coming towards us. These will help us find the side of a table. Now we just need to draw two horizontal lines parallel to the other horizontal lines in the drawing to make the top of the table in one point perspective. Next we can draw the two table legs at the front of the table first. Just two straight vertical lines of equal length. Now we can add two more vertical lines from the back corners of the table for the two back legs. So now we've got a table with four legs. We can now erase some of the dark lines that we no longer need in this drawing and add some details to the table. We can draw a second horizontal line at the front edge to give the tabletop a thickness. We can double up the vertical lines at the front, the front table legs, to make them look more solid. As the vanishing point is in the middle of the table, the table's in the middle of the vanishing point, we'll be able to see the side of the left table leg and the side of the right table leg, and the bottom of each of the table legs, the bottom side of each of the table legs, will go as a diagonal line all the way to our vanishing point. We can repeat this process for the back legs of the table. Again, the base of the legs will go towards our vanishing point, and this baseline, this diagonal line going to the vanishing point, will also go forwards towards the front table legs too, so it will be one line. Now we have a room, a door and a table in one point perspective. Next we can add some evenly spaced marks at the base of the back of the wall, at this rectangle at the back of the drawing. And then we need a series of lines which originate, which start from the vanishing point and go past each of these spaced marks. And we can draw them coming towards us and these will be floorboards. Now we can draw two more lines from our vanishing point going towards the right side of the paper. These will show us the top and the bottom lines of a window in perspective in one point perspective. 
Next, we just need to draw two vertical lines between these two diagonal lines. But the side thickness of the wall of the room, these two short horizontal lines will just be horizontal. They won't be in perspective because we're looking straight at them in the same way that we're looking straight at the back of the room, which is just stays as a rectangle. The only lines which are distorted are the lines that are going away from us. Next, we could add a door handle to the door. It is now time to raise some of the lines that we no longer need on the back wall of our room. We could add a big window on the wall. We just need to draw a rectangle for this. But we can use the vanishing point again as our window that I've drawn is in the centre and the vanishing point's in the middle of the window more or less. So we can draw lines to work out the thickness at the corners of the window, the thickness of the wall of the room. So again, it's the same process that we used for the drawing at the beginning, the basic shape of the room at the beginning. We just need to draw a diagonal line from each of the corners of the rectangle. And then we need to draw another rectangle within that and that will create the thickness of the wall. Next we could add a straight vertical line from the ceiling, a short straight vertical line from the ceiling, and then draw a light shade and a light bulb. The base of the light shade will just be a small ellipse, a squashed circle, a circle seen in perspective, and then just put two lines to make it a triangle at the top, and a little semicircle inside it to make it a simple light. For the next steps I will add some more details to this drawing and then I'll add some simple shadows too. Okay, so hopefully you guys were able to watch that video. If not, go ahead and click on the link now and then just leave it open and then you guys can kind of watch it or browse through it. Um, 
at a later time. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to set up your uh, interior perspective drawing. So I got my camera working today. And hopefully you guys can see this here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically draw my little cubby that I have. If I can just turn it over that way. I'm going to draw that right on my paper. So as you guys saw there, it was more of like a rectangle shape. So I'm going to kind of start off with that uh, before I even do my horizon line. Because I just want to make sure that I have a good kind of shape going. Now I am using a ruler and I do see where I am measuring from top to bottom. And then just to make sure that it's straight here. I'm kind of lining it up with the, whoops, you guys can't see. I'm lining it up with my holes here on my one edge. So there is my rectangle to start with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out the horizon line, which is going to be about where I'm sitting. So probably about there. Okay, so this is going to be my horizon line. And then my vanishing point, I'm about in the center. I'm going to put it slightly off center. So right here. So what I like to do is I'm going to go ahead and trace my line here to at least the corner of the room from that vanishing point. And then I'm just going to draw dark here. Just like we saw in that one video. So I'm kind of lightly pressing down and then I'm going to heavily press down. And then this direction to that corner. And press down. And then same vanishing point to corner. And then pressing down. So then if I ended up erasing my mark here. You guys should be able to see, ooh, excuse me. You should be able to see sort of like a perspective starting, right? And then the next step is just drawing um, the doors. So I do have a couple doors here. Um, and I actually have a ceiling top also. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and draw the ceiling tops first. So I I'm going to say it's going to come down to probably about here with that top line. And then it ends up popping down just a little on either side. And then I'm going to connect these two lines. And then I'm going to have my wall. So as you can see, as I start to build this, it's starting to kind of form into a room a little bit. And you should be able to start seeing the perspective. And notice that my drawings, I'm only doing the vertical and horizontal lines. And that's it. So this one actually should be a little bit more angled. So this is actually slightly off. So let me go ahead and erase this line and try and redraw it. Sometimes that happens.
And then, let me see about the bottom line again. There we go. And then a horizontal line. That's looking a little bit better. So then I also have a countertop. So I have like a mirror happening and then a countertop that actually sits kind of low. So I'm going to say that my countertop is actually, the edge is going to be right here. And it'll also recede back. And then the top part of my mirror is actually rise, is risen slightly. So I actually have kind of like a curved bulging edge almost. And then of course, a little bit of a corner line. I also have a sink. So I'm drawing that ellipse right here. And then I do have some other things on my counter, but I'm not going to worry about it much. But hopefully you guys can kind of tell that this is the sink. We've got the faucet right here. So then the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw the front part of my cabinet, which is going to go to about here. And then we're going to go just add a little bit of detail here. And then I'm going to connect my back lines because that's going to be the back part of my cabinet. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and shade underneath just to give it a little bit of shading. And then just a little bit of shading for my little countertop here. And then I actually have shading on the floor. And this might be a little bit darker, so I may want to go over it a little bit more. And by doing that, I'm just pressing harder with my pencil. So there's like the back part of my room. Do you guys see that? Do you have any questions on how I got this far? So basically at this point, this is where I would start adding my other details. There's a door. Um, I actually have three doors over here. Um, so for instance, my next door would actually be probably starting about here. And it, the top of the door actually comes to about the top of this horizontal right here on my ceiling. So that'll be one door and then it ends up coming off of the paper 
for me. So I'll just draw that little vanishing line there for the top part of the door. And then I would do the same thing for the edge. So you can see here, there's this edge, right? And I would pretty much just try to echo the same kind of direction for the border of my door. And then there's a couple hinges because it opens this way. And then there's another hinge here. So then here's my one door frame. Here's where that space is. And then there's patterns on my door and stuff like that. But at this point, I'm just not going to worry about it to save time. On the other side, I have two doors, but I have one that's actually open. So it is cracked a little bit um, with my door. So just to show you how to do that, and then I know it's 652, so we'll probably end after that. But just to show where that is, you would know that the frame would be about the same, right? No worries. See you guys. Uh, but the door would be about the, f the same kind of edge point, right? However, this ends up sort of becoming like this angle. So I'm going to say my door stops here and comes out. And then this actually touches the ground. And this line would also be echoed here but it would be the opposite. So it's almost as if the vanishing point shifts for this door to open. And then I'm just gonna say that it ends up closing here. Although this should probably be down further so it'll connect to this horizontal line. So there's some adjustment that may be needed. And then basically, since this door is closed, all of this would get erased. And then I have a door handle that's sticking out probably about here. And then since this is a mirror, I would probably want to mirror it in the background. But you guys can kind of see how the door would be open and how it would overlap something. You guys can see the shading involved with it and how to start it all. Um, and you'll be able to see the shading on the top with the ceiling here. So this is sort of how you would start your interior drawing. And what I'd like for you guys to do is in your sketchbook, Try to draw an interior room, whether it's in your house, whether it is um, in your bedroom, um, I don't know, in a restaurant, if you guys have your own little studio space, whatever you would like to do. Okay, any questions on this drawing? Okay, perfect. Uh, Aislinn and Zara, if you guys are good to go and don't have any questions, then you guys are free to leave. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Um, have a great rest of your week, and I'll see you guys next Thursday.
Thank you. It, it's night. But it's good. <laughs> I'm hungry. I'm ready for dinner myself. So. <laughs> Sure, you can share something. I will. You want to screen share, right? Just want to make sure. Okay, let me go ahead and go screen share and then let me unlock it for you here. Let me know if you have any questions while you're showing it um, or anything like that. You should be able to screen share now. Hopefully it's working. I have it unlocked for you. Oh. Uh, do you want to try sending it again? Or maybe it just hasn't come through yet? You might have to refresh. Sometimes I do that and it'll like pop in within 30 seconds or something like that. Hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, you can always send it to me if you'd like. Um, here, I can type my email in the chat. Feel free to send it to me. You'll probably get an automated message back because I'm not going to be in, in 
the office tomorrow. But feel free to just send it to me, um, and I'll take a look at it, and I'll even give you some pointers. Um, feel free to ask questions or anything like that. I have my email open now, so if you want to try sending it now, um, it should hopefully come through. Let me know if you do send it. Okay, let me check and see if it has come through yet. Hmm. Hmm. Did you find it? <laughs> 